God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you all for, amen, tuning in and being a part of the ministry this day. Amen. We pray God's blessings upon your life. Amen. And you that have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we beckon you to do so. We don't have a lot of time left in this earth. The church age is going to come to an end. The world is going to continue on for a period of time. Amen. Uh, straight through the reign of the Antichrist. And then, of course, the reign of the Antichrist will come to an end where he will be overthrown. But then there will be a time of millennium where Christ will rule over the nations. Amen. And at the end of that millennium, praise God, is where the nations again will turn against Christ. And, of course, they will be overthrown. And this is where we come to the end of the world. And then the world will face the, the amen, day of judgment, the great white throne judgment, where the nations will stand before, amen, God, and give an answer for why they rejected the message of Christ. And of course, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Everyone will be found guilty, though they will be, the day of judgment is like, a day in court, but it's a day where everyone that stand before God will lose. Everyone. The world will stand before Christ to be judged. And the saints will be a part of judging the world. We will judge the nations with Christ. Those that have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ will be a part of judging, amen, the world, amen, for their rejection of Christ. And when that time comes, of course, they will all be found guilty. This is the end. This is what, see, when we look at the end, there's, when we read the Bible, there's different ends. Praise God. When we read the Bible, it talks about uh, uh, Christ being the end of the law in righteousness because the dispensation of the law would have to come to an end. And then the dispensation of, of grace would begin. Amen. There's also a time where the Bible talks about the end of the temple. Amen. And Jesus told the apostles about how did the Jewish temple will come to an end. He said that will be not one stone laid upon another that shall not be uh, cast down. Praise God. And this was to be the end of the temple. And then he also explained how that uh, there will be one that will stand in the temple, in the holy place. Uh, and this one will be uh, uh, Titus, the general Titus. They will march uh, into the temple and will destroy the temple. And at that time, Jesus said, uh, uh, you know, he talks about not letting your flight be in the winter. Praise God. Pray that your flight not be in the winter. And pray that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath day. Amen. And he's talking all about the destruction of the temple there. In the 70 AD, that came, came to pass. Where the temple of, of the Jewish temple came to its end. It came to its end. Praise God. So that's another end. Amen. But it ended in 70 AD. Jesus told them that your house shall be laid unto you desolate, prophesying about the end of the temple, because they was not able to receive him as Messiah. And he said, until you can say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, which is to say, when you're able to see me as Messiah, until that time, your temple is going to come to the end. Praise God. It's going to come to an end. And it did. So that's it's, it's a couple of ends in the Bible. Then there is, praise God, of course, the end of the church age where we talk about how people coined the phrase of, of, the, of, the, of the church being taken out of the earth is the word rapture. I would rather say the church will be taken out of the earth. You can call it the first resurrection. Amen. Uh, I would rather use biblical terminology for that. But there will be a time where the church, as Jesus explained, one will be in the field. There'll be one uh, left and another taken. Uh, there'll be, praise God, one a, a, be, will be two in the field, one taken, one left. There'll be two in the bed. One will be taken, the other left. Amen. Descri describing the catching away of the saints where we will be, amen, uh, caught up to meet him. And forever will we be with him. That is the end of the church age. Amen. Uh, 
is better described as the first resurrection. Because the first resurrection involves the resurrection of the just. The day that Jesus takes the church out of the earth, there will be a resurrection of the saints. We call that the first resurrection. Amen. Where uh, the dead in Christ uh, will be, uh, they're going to be, uh, they're going to come, praise God, with Christ to be reunited with their bodies. Amen. But right now, they are with Christ, amen, uh, at this time because we're looking at them from a spiritual standpoint. Because the true person is the spirit. And those that have left their bodies are now present with the Lord. Those that have were serving the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in generations past, amen, are now with him right now. Your loved ones that died in Christ, that died living for Christ, are now in the presence of God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, but they will return. And at their return, we call that their first resurrection. Jesus, when he returns for the church, he's not coming alone. Praise God. And he described it this way. He said, where the, where the body is, there will the eagles be gathered. The eagles were referring to the saints that will come back with him. They're going to be reunited with their bodies. Wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered. They're going to reunite with their bodies. They're going to end up uh, going through uh, uh, where uh, they'll go through a metamorphosis and their body's going to be changed in terms of their bodies will become a glorified body. Amen. And they will um, ascend. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then they that are alive and remain, talking about those that are believers, shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. That time is not that far away. We made it up to 2022, according to our calendar. Uh, and I'm surprised we made it that long, praise God, because the church age is, is about to come to an end. And those that will get on board, those that will give their life to Jesus, they need to do it swiftly. Swiftly. Because when that age ends, when the church is taken out of the earth and you're left behind because you decided not to follow Jesus, I don't I can't promise you a good future in that. Praise God. You want to get on board now. You want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ swiftly. Don't waste no time. The only time God has given you, because his time, your time rather, is in his hands. He's the one to determine the day you will be born. Praise God. So your time's are in his hands. He only gave you enough time to make a decision to follow Jesus. If you misuse that time and live in sin, then you just might die in your sins. And any life without Christ is a life of sin. It's a life of sin. No matter what your age group may be, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. And if you don't repent of your sins and be baptized in the most holy name of Jesus Christ, yielding your life unto him, giving your life unto him, you will perish. Praise God. You need to give your life to him. And this is an individual choice. Your, your parents can't make it for you, can't make this choice for you. Your neighbors can't make this choice for you. This is between you and God, this decision to follow Jesus. Nobody can do that for you. We can wish it for you. We can desire it for you. We can pray that you make that decision, but we can't make it for you. It's a whosoever will. Let him come. Praise God. Let him come. Let him come. Let her come. Praise God. Amen. Let, let every boy come. Let every girl come. Let every man come. Let every woman come. Come to Jesus. Praise God. Because when he died on that cross, he gave you an opportunity to have eternal life. You can live for him now because he died for your sins. You can serve him now because he gave his life for you that you may be able to give your life to him. Praise God. Praise God. And being resurrected from the dead, it was all for your benefit that Christ resurrected from the dead. 
And now he ascended after resurrecting, resurrecting from the dead. He ascended back to heaven and he sits on the throne. And now you can come to the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. What you need is salvation. You need to come to the throne of grace and cry out to God for the salvation of your soul. Don't worry about what you need materialistically. But concern yourself first with the salvation of your soul. Concern yourself with that. Because that's what's more important. Your eternity, where you will spend eternity, is more important than anything else we could talk about. Give your life to the most holy and true one, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Give your life to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He's the only one that can redeem you. He's the only one that can give you eternal life. Praise God. He's the only one. He is the author of eternal life. It all begins with him. Let's go swiftly into the word of God for today. We're going to go back to the message we preach, the good fight. The good fight. We're going back to that. Amen. The good fight. Amen. We're going to try to end it, praise God, today for you. But we're looking at the good fight. Praise God, the good fight. So let's start in um, 1 Timothy 6 chapter, I believe, what is this, 12th verse? Yes. 1 yes. Timothy 6 chapter, 12th verse. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, Paul is asking Timothy to do what he have done himself. Praise God. Now that you're saved, you're in a fight. And the fight, praise God, is worth you giving your all for. You're now fighting for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to contend with the powers of darkness so that you may bring glory to God. You're going to, praise God, you're going to cast down strongholds. Praise God. You're going to pull down strongholds. You're going to cast down evil imaginations. Praise God. You're going to come up against everything that comes up against God. You're going to come up against spiritual wickedness in high places. Praise God. You're going to come up against principalities and powers. You're going to come up against the rulers of darkness. We're going to come up against everything that's not like Christ. Because you must glorify him. And that's a fight. That's a fight to do that. Praise God. Amen. To do what is right, you have to fight. And what is right? But that you glorify Christ in word, deed, and in thought. Your very thoughts have to glorify him. Your very thoughts. Because your thoughts determine your actions. So we glorify him in thought. In word and in deed. Praise the name of God. Hallelujah. Let's move on. We're going to go to uh, the book of Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. Now, we're just going to do a profile on the man who talked about a good fight. We're going to look at the fight that he fought. Oh, brother Paul, he fought a good fight. This brother, amen, fought like no other. He was like our champion in Christ. Praise the name of God. He was not just a soldier, but he was a warrior. He understood the mission. He understood what God was calling him to do and what God has ordained for him to do and what God has ordained the church to do. And so he told Timothy, an upcoming contender against the powers of darkness. He told him to fight a good fight, and we're going to see how Paul fought, praise God. Now, remember, God used this man so mightily that he wrote most of the New Testament. We accredit, amen, most of the writings of the New Testament to this apostle, Paul. Praise God. But as God increases you, as God exhorts you, it does come with a, with a price, though, because you're going to have to now, as you get exalted, 
as Paul said in one place, he said, the uh, effectual door has been opened unto me. And he's talking about he had more opportunities to give the gospel. He said, effectual door has been opened unto me, but there'll be many adversaries. Because you're moving up. Every time you move up in the spiritual realm, you have to come up against different rims of darkness. You have to come up against, praise God, principalities. Amen. Because you're moving up in the spiritual realm. Because the now as a fighter, praise God, you got more contenders now. And Paul said there'd be many adversaries. I just knocked this devil out. There's another demon to knock out. Praise the name of God. Praise God. This tread upon this one. Now I got tread upon another. Praise God. Always contenders. I'm in the ring fighting for Jesus. I'm standing for the defense of the gospel. And I got to keep fighting the powers of darkness. And as soon as I end one match, another match begins. Praise the name of God. Thoughts come into your mind. It's not just thoughts. Those are, amen, elements of darkness coming against you. Anything, any thought that comes to you that's not like Christ, know that you have to fight against that. Don't submit to it. But cast it down in the name of Jesus Christ. Any evil thought. Because it's a fight. It's a fight. You're not just having bad thoughts. You're in a fight, praise God. And sometimes to replace a thought, you have to then understand how to defeat that thought. And how do you defeat wicked thoughts coming to your mind? You begin to speak God's word. And as you speak God's word, your mind will have to shut down to hear what the mouth is saying, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes you don't got nothing on your mind, so the devil comes along and puts something on your mind. Because your mind's supposed to be stayed on him, stayed on Jesus. Because he said, I'll keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me. You're fighting now, praise God. But you got to keep your mind on the Lord. If you're walking around here like a blank sheet of paper, you got your mind on nothing, the devil going to show up. You're going to start plaguing you because your mind's not centered on Christ. But as he come against you, just, just go ahead and center your mind on Christ. Begin to quote scriptures and keep on quoting until your mind had to shut down, to, I mean, until your mouth rather, or your mind rather had to shut down to hear what your mouth is saying. As you begin to speak, you can't speak without concentrating. Concentrate on what you're saying. Just like if I ask you to count uh, uh, 10 backwards, you couldn't do that successfully unless you think about what you do. And then you could count to 10 backwards. Well, what happened to the thoughts you had before you start counting backwards? That had to be dismissed because your mouth will cause your mind to shut down to hear what the mouth is saying. Because you got to concentrate on what you're doing. I always tell people, maybe because you're not doing nothing, you're having these bad thoughts. Praise God. Pick up the word of God and start reading it until your mind shut down to her what your mouth is saying. Show you how to overpower the realms of darkness that comes up against your mind. That brings a mental consult against you. That's a mental assault that they're coming against you. You're saying where these bad thoughts come from. You're in the fight. That's where they come from. You're in the battle. That's where they come from. But cast down those evil imaginations. How you do it? You replace those thoughts with a thought by your mouth speaking God's word. Praise the name of God. Meditation is all about, when you meditate on God's word both day and night, it's all about the word becoming now a part of your thoughts. You're meditating so that the word would come off the pages and end up in your mind. So all you can think is the word of God. Praise the name of God. So you're in a battle. But we're going to look at this champion here because it's a lot to learn from this champion, our dear brother Paul. He was definitely a Moses to the Gentiles. See, Israel had their Moses, and we ended up with a Moses because Paul was sent to win the Gentiles. And Paul became our Moses. Praise God. Hallelujah. He became our Moses. Hallelujah. 
But let's keep reading, yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 18. Yes. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Drop down to verse 24. Of the Jews, five... Now, now, now watch this. See, he's trying to win, praise God, the people that he actually brought to Christ. The Corinthian church is a church that was led to Christ through the missionary work of Apostle Paul. Paul went down to Corinth and turned these people from darkness unto the marvelous light by the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached to them. These people was into all realms of darkness. And they was really immersed in darkness. Far as witchcraft, voodoo, all of this stuff, these people was immersed in it. But then Brother Paul comes and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And where they was operating under the powers of darkness, now they begin to operate under the power of God. And this was a church that Paul said you came behind in no spiritual gift. So they was used mightily in the spiritual realm later. Amen. Every gift that God was given to the church or had given to the church, amen, was revealed in this church called Corinth. But remember, these are people that exercise themselves in the realms of darkness before, and now they exercise themselves in the realm of God's spirit operating in the power of God. Praise God. But because Paul was the one that gave birth to this church, usually a church that one gives birth to would take on your gifts. Paul didn't have, Paul came not short of any spiritual gift himself. So then the church he started ended up being just like the one that led them to Christ. The gifts of God was flourishing in Corinth to a point that when we read, amen, about the gifts of the spirit, we read it, we read it in the book called the Corinthians. In the book of Corinth, you read about the different gifts that God gave to the church. Because it was in operation in them. That's what we read about. It. So this was mighty church. But they got off course. And they started listening to deceivers. Foolish folk. Folk that was perpetrating a fraud. And so Paul, willing to reach them, Paul said, you, you receive fools gladly. I guess I'll become a fool for you. Those that glory in the flesh, you want to follow them. He said, so let me glory. Praise God. He said, let me become a fool in glory. So he started talking about the things he went through. But Paul's aim was to bring them back to the will of God. And hearing the true messengers of God and dismissing these false ones that was coming to them. Paul was trying to help them out. But in helping them out, we can see what Paul went through in his good fight, the good fight of faith. We can see it. And he's going to point out some things he had to undergo as a champion for Christ. We're looking at the good fight. Let's look at some of the things that Paul went through in this good fight. Go ahead and read, daughter. Second Corinthians chapter 11, drop down to verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Now watch this. See, that's old English. He really saying he received thirty nine stripes, forty minus one. He said, save one. And how many times he received that? Five times. Five times thirty nine is how many stripes he really received. He's telling you, look, five times receive I thirty nine stripes. Now watch this. Each time when the Jews beat you, they beat you. They give you at least thirty nine. Uh, whips on your back. Paul said, I received, this happened to me, listen, five times. Five times. I'm showing you what I had to go through to glorify God. I know that in the modern day message, uh, everything is on the, the basis of prosperity, material gain, and you think that's the blessing of the Lord. And being blessed of the Lord is having you know, all kind of material gain. But Paul is saying the blessing of the Lord is being, being able to endure persecution against those that come against you. 
to be persecuted but not turn away from Christ. Uh, to go through hell and high waters but still find yourself standing on that solid rock, which is Christ. True, a true testimony, a true fighter is one that no matter what goes wrong, he stays in the fight. He keep on living for Jesus. That's a fight. So Paul is saying, praise God, though things went wrong, I didn't do wrong. Praise God. Praise God. So the whole idea here is that uh, though I was shooken, I'm being shaken now. I wasn't shooken a loose from God. Huh? Oh, yeah, I, I was shaken. I was beat down. I was beaten, but they couldn't beat the Jesus out of me, though, praise God. They whipped me. They put whips on my body with the idea that they could stop me from serving Jesus. This was to deter me from preaching the gospel and from living from the Lord, but it didn't work. That's what he's saying. The Jews beat me five times, 39 Five times, 39 stripes was on my body, praise God. And there's one place where Paul uh, to told the people, say, listen, uh, let no man uh, 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 speak against me. In other words, he said, because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And all he was saying is that they beat Jesus with a canine whip, they beat me too. I got the marks to prove Every stripe represents, praise God. You know, in, in, in the military, you get stripes, praise God. Paul said, listen, I'm just moving up the ranks, praise God. See all these stripes I got? All that I went through to prove that I was truly a soldier of the Lord, a true fighter for Jesus. My God, my God. They whipped me, but they could not whip the Jesus out of me, praise God. They couldn't turn me from serving him. They couldn't convince me from following him. They tried, though. See, the devil's going to try, but he's not going to try him. Praise God. He's going to try you, but he's just not going to try him. Paul said they tried to whoop the Jesus out of me, and I'm still loving Jesus. Whoop, there's another. Oh, my God, there's another whoop. Ah, oh, there it is, praise God, but I love Jesus. And I don't feel that God has let me down. I'm still going to serve him. Though they whip me to threats. Pause. It happened five times to Jews. And when the Jews whip you, they give you an old-fashioned whipping. And then you know you've been whipped. You won't, even be able to, you won't even be able to sit down or lean against anything. When they get finished whipping you, you praise God. You be so messed up, so wounded. But yet Paul said, in all of this, in all of this, I'm standing for it my king whipped amen to a part to a point where most people would have been broken they would have been some of them would have turned back out into the world but I didn't I'm still serving the Lord I went through things unimaginable being beaten by the Jews and the Jews would beat you merciless they will beat you till they try to beat you, beat you so bad that you only have your sanity. They're hoping you lose your sanity. But Paul said, God kept me. Why? Because I'm fighting the good fight. That's why I could tell Timothy to fight the good fight. I'm telling him to do what I'd already done. Go ahead, keep reading, doing this. Look at what, what else this warrior had to go through to be in this good fight. Yes. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Now watch this. Thrice, old English, three times. A whip. Look, they couldn't break me with a whip. So I said, we're going to need a rod for Paul. Paul still serving Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Paul still out there preaching. After we whipped him to threads, he still got, praise God, a heart and a passion for God. He's out there preaching and telling men and women to come to Jesus. Oh, he's fighting a good fight. Praise God. A good fight. So we couldn't convince him with the cannon whip. That didn't work, praise God. That didn't work. Let's go get some rods. 
And we try to break some bones now, praise God. We put some stripes on them. But now we're going to see, can we break some bones? Praise the name of God. But when God gets in the picture, not a bone shall be broken. Praise the name of God. My God, my God, my God. Paul's going to go to Paul say three times. They beat me with rods. My God, my God. And still Paul said, I'm standing strong. They couldn't break me. They couldn't break my spirit. Praise God. I'm still in love with Jesus. In fact, I love him more than before. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 So three times I was beaten with rods. Oh, he sounds like a true soldier, don't he? He sounds like a warrior. Praise God. You can't break him. Can't break him. Can't break him. You ever heard of, in, in, in military the term a prisoner of war where they would tick you and torture you? Try to make you break you, try to break you down. That's what they were doing to Paul. Paul became a prisoner of war, but the war he's fighting is for Christ. Paul said, Oh, yeah, they, they, they tried to break me. But Paul, praise God, later on wrote to the Paul wrote to the Roman uh, uh, church and said, Listen, what can separate us? See all he went through? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. No, no, nothing present, no things to come. Huh? All that I go through, all that I've been through, nothing can stop me from serving Jesus. There's some folk, the smallest thing, they, they back out there doing what they did before because they really didn't surrender. They just didn't know it. It took the persecution to reveal where the heart was at. Paul's heart was in the right place. That's why you couldn't break him. That's why you couldn't break him. Some people are serving God from the surface. It's not from the heart. And they will turn back. At the smallest thing, they will turn back. But Paul, Paul is sold out. He's sold out, praise God. There's no going back in Paul. That's why he could deal with all of this. When you go wholeheartedly after God, nothing can deter you or cause you to go back. Nothing. Those that go back, check yourself. You wasn't, it wasn't a hard thing for you. Praise God. You hadn't come truly from the heart. You went through formalities. And you may have went through ceremonies and even rituals. But you didn't come from the heart. Because when God gets your heart, there's no turning back for you. There's no turning back. Praise God. You couldn't break this man. You couldn't break him. The only thing left was to kill him because you can't break him. You can't break him. And that's what they came to that conclusion. We're going to see that later. They came to the conclusion you can't stop Paul from serving God. The only way we can come close to that is to take his life because then the man's going to be willing to give his life for God. He don't care. If it's to bring God to glory, then hey, there, there I go. Praise the name of God. Paul said to live is Christ, because he's ready now, and to die is gain. Isn't that amazing? Paul said, if I'm living, I'm living for Christ. And if I die, I'm dying for him too, praise God. So to live is Christ, and to die is gain, because I'm going to be with him, praise God. So what can you do to stop me, because I'm fighting the good fight? How can you stop me from serving the Lord? If I lose my job, you think I'm going to stop serving him? Huh? Or I get foreclosed in the house, you think I'm going to stop serving him? Or my friends turn against me, the neighbors turn against me, church members turn against me. You think that's going to stop me from serving God? It's probably going to bring me closer. Probably going to bring me closer because I'm going to realize all I have is him in the end. Praise God. That's all I have. Praise God. Praise God. And, and having Jesus is more than enough. If all you have is Jesus, then all you have is enough, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you feel like you don't got enough, if all you have is Jesus, then all you have is enough, praise God. Hallelujah. Got to come to that place. That's wholeheartedness talking now. When you're wholehearted, you talk that way and think that way. Praise God. Though I enjoy you, enjoy your fellowship, enjoy your friendship. 
if that ends, it won't change what I have with Jesus. That's praise God. It won't change that, praise God. Hallelujah. You just might reveal yourself to me, but you won't change what I have with Jesus. Praise God. If the closest ones separate from me, it won't change what I have with Jesus. In fact, I could probably make it better. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to learn that all I need is Jesus. All I need is Jesus. And if all I have is Jesus, praise God, then Jesus is really all I need. Hallelujah. Let's go on, daughter. So he's been beaten five times, 39, 39 times five, because each time they tick you through these beatings, they give you 39 stripes. Paul said he went through this pr process five times. So five times 39 is how many stripes Paul ended up on his body. And then that wasn't enough. Now I'm going to get some more beatings, which came through rods. We don't know these could be iron rods. We don't know what type of rods it were. But, it, but whatever it was, it was painful. And the whole idea, the devil is not just trying to come against you. He's trying to break up the relationship between you and Christ. People that's being used by the devil don't know that the devil has assigned you to try to break up what this one has with Jesus. But it's not possible, praise God. If you lost your job, it's not the end of the world and it's certainly not the beginning. Praise God. Don't worry about it. You got Jesus? Don't never take your job and tell somebody, I lost everything. Because your job is not your everything. Jesus is your everything. If you lose your house, never say you lost everything because you have Jesus. He is your everything. I may have lost some things, but I never lost everything, which is Jesus. Hallelujah. I've heard people make the mistake and stand up and testimony and say, I lost everything. You did. You did. So all those things you lost was your everything. I thought Jesus is everything because he is. So I'll never say, I've suffered many losses in life, but I have not lost everything because of Jesus. Because Jesus is my everything. If the husband walks out and the wife, you haven't lost everything. If you have Jesus, you still have everything, which is Christ. Or if the, if, if, if the uh, wife walks out and the husband, if you're saved, you ain't lost everything. Because you have Jesus. He is your everything. Praise God. There have been men that committed suicide because their wives left them. Because their wives became their everything. And if their wife become their everything, we know Jesus is not there. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. You're going to kill yourself over a woman? Or a woman kill herself over a man? That's telling me you don't know Jesus. Because when you know Jesus, you look at that with a smile. Say, it's okay. Praise God. Go ahead. You want me to help pack your bags for you? Praise God. <laughs> Because I got Jesus. If you walk out, you miss out, not me. Praise God. Not me. You miss out. That's what a husband should be able to tell a wife if she walks out. Or a wife should be able to tell a husband if he walks out. And if kids walk out on you, praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You still have Jesus. Amen. Oh, baby. You know, you're the one going to lose. Tell your children you're going to lose. Praise God. You walk out, you walk out. Amen. But nothing ends between me and Jesus. Everything that's coming is to bring to, to an end. The devil is trying to bring to the uh, end your relationship. Your troubles is not just troubles. It is to affect your relationship with Christ. That's the devil's aim. He's trying to find a way to rock the boat. He's trying to find a breaking point. And this is what was going on with Paul. He's trying to find a breaking point, but couldn't find it. Couldn't find. Oh, they kept. He kept searching, though. Praise God. You, you're gonna read about some more of that. Kept searching the rods. The praise God being beat. Praise God for whip. Uh, he's still searching, but Paul's still standing strong. What's you, that's that's all you're working with. That's all you got. I'm in this battle. I'm I'm gonna win this. It's already won. It's a good fight because I'm fighting for Jesus. I'm fighting for Jesus. Oh, it's a good fight. It's good. Yes, keep reading. Once I was stoned. Now, see, the devil's still coming. 
Everything that could possibly make a person stop following Jesus happened to Paul. Paul's out was stoned. And do you know when Paul was stoned? I think it was at, what's this place called? I'm trying to remember. Was it Lystra? Where Paul was stoned at, the disciples thought he had died. And I believe he did. Paul was laying there lifeless, and they circled around Paul. I believe that probably was the time when Paul was caught up into the third heaven. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. You know, Paul talked about how he was caught up into the third heaven and heard things. See, when the devil thought he did something, God said, I'm going to take this moment and take you up high, you brother. Now the devil think he did something because stone Paul. I really believe Paul, because Paul began to say, when I had this vision, he said, come into visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body. Because see, when you, if a person leaves his life, it's an out of the body experience because your spirit's going to leave your body. Paul said, I'm confused. I don't know when it happened. But when he say above 14 years ago, it places him back to Lystra. I believe that place was Lystra, if I hope I got it right, pronunciation. It was 14 years ago when you study that Paul was stoned. I think 14 years have passed. And Paul gives the number, which gives us, the investigators of God's word, a, a chance to look up some things. He said above 14 years ago, he had this experience. It was exactly, I believe, 14 years ago that he had been stoned. When he was stoned. So most likely when they when they gathered around Paul and Paul was laying there lifeless, it was probably at the time where Paul was caught up into the spirit. And he said he heard things that wasn't lawful for a man to utter. Praise God. I can't even tell you what God told me. Praise God. I can talk about it. I said, but my God, my God. It, it's, it's, a, it's a strong possibility. I'm just doing a little investigation and saying this. Amen in my studies. But at any rate, Paul is still proving that he's in the good fight. That none of these things was able to break Paul. Being stoned. Being stoned. But it wasn't Paul's time to end at this point. God had more work for him. And the brethren gathered around Paul until God raised them back from the dead. Paul got up. Or when the Jews put rocks to your head, they're not just throwing rocks. They're trying to kill you. They're saying, listen, we beat you. That ain't working. We beat you with whips. Still, y'all here preaching. They say, we got to stop brother Paul. Paul got to be stopped. We beat you with rods. You're still out here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, brother Paul ain't going to give up. So the next thing left is stoned him to death. And they stoned him. They say, Paul is done now. He's finished. Because the Jews keep, th they, they will throw the stones until they see you go completely out. And then they stop throwing because you're going now. And when they thought old brother Paul was gone, they walking away, the brethren standing around Paul. God raised them up. My God. I bet you the brethren probably said, man, you know, this got to be God. <laughs> we, we never witnessed anybody surviving a stoning from the Jews. You don't get stoned. I, in fact, well, he was stoned, not by the Jews, but he, well, he was stoned in Lystra. Well, I, I got to go back to that because... I think it was a mixed audience that was involved in this. But Paul was, was stoned. And the stonings that take place, when you read Old, or New and Old Testament scripture, it never ends with a survivor. It ends in death. Those that are professional stone throwers, where do you think they're aiming at? Your feet? It's coming to your head. They know how to kill you. And enough rocks hit you inside your head, you through booking, no matter who you are. So these professional stone throwers, they probably don't miss their target, aiming at your head. You know how many rocks hit Paul in his head? Down he go. 
done. They thought they had done something. They finished their job as they've killed other people by stoning. But God raised the man up. And I believe that's the time when he had this out-of-the-body experience. Because out-of-the-body can represent death here. But you'll see that a little further. So he was stoned. What was the next thing that happened to him? Thrice I suffered shipwreck a night and a day. I had been in the deep. So that's another place that's survivors are very slim in that. Because when you go out there in the midst of the sea, in the deep, where there's no more shoreline, and the, the storms that take place out in the sea is like no other. And that's why many sh ships are swallowed up. He says shipwreck. That means that the storm came in the sea and they broke the ship to pieces. There should be no survivors in that. Because no matter how good of a swimmer you are, you, it's too much water for you to drink. You, you, you can't hold your breath long enough. But we read about Brother Paul in the shipwreck where God moved upon him before the shipwreck took place. And he prophesied and told the people there would be no harm done to anybody. Told them to stay on the ship, though it breaks to pieces, don't, don't jump, don't do anything. And then old Apostle Paul comes sailing in. They're holding on to rifle. He riding on in. And guess where he ran, ride into? An island where he had a revival. Where Paul began to heal the sick. But what God did for Brother Paul when he got on that island. You know, islands are into all kinds of things. Most islands I know of is islands that practice voodoo, witchcraft. They know all kinds of works of rims of doctrine. And I'm quite sure when Paul got there, Paul had to convince them that I know you guys been following voodoo and witchcraft, but have you ever heard about Jesus? Have you ever heard about, my God, the love of your soul, praise God? Have you ever heard about the Redeemer, the Savior of the whole world? My God, my God. However Paul delivered that message, he convinced the whole island to give their life to Jesus. They got in line, forming lines, and Paul started healing the sick, casting out devils. Praise the name of God. But all this was, was a result of a shipwreck initially. And the shipwreck caused them, the broken pieces of the ship, they, those people held on to those pieces. Some of them that couldn't swim had to float on in, ended up in the island where Paul preached the gospel. You would think everything that was made to break Paul caused him to preach the gospel even stronger. That's a true soldier. When you're in the fight, everything that go wrong, you don't turn away from the Lord, you turn to the Lord. Everything that goes wrong in your life is just a point of, of, of fellowship between you and the Lord. That's why Paul said, listen, he wanted to know the Lord in the fellowship of his sufferings. When you are suffering, this is the time to call on Jesus as you have never called on him before. And you're going to get a fellowship with God that you have never experienced. It's unreal in the midst of pain and suffering, disappointment and tragedy. Call on the name of Jesus. I'm talking to the, to the believer. And see the difference in your fellowship. Praise God. My God, my God, you haven't tasted God's goodness until you go through something. My God, my God. God will show up and he will show out when you call upon his most holy name in the, in, in the darkness of your midnight. God will answer you. God will answer you. Your life, your situation, your circumstance can be so horrific, but yet God can show you himself as you have never seen them before. Praise the name of God. Fight the good fight. Things are going to go wrong in life. But welcome to the real world where things go wrong. But don't you cop out because things are going wrong. But pick up. My God, the bloodstained banner. Become a stronger soldier in Christ. Get closer to him. 
though you don't even understand why you're going through. You're going through because something is trying to break the relationship between you and God. But you can take the trouble that the devil bring and get closer to God. That's what you can do. Fight the good fight. My God, my God. Go ahead and finish reading, Dorna. And journeyings often in pearls of water and yes. pearls of robbers and pearls by my own. The word pearls really means dangers. Yes. By my own countrymen and pearls by the heathen and pearls in the city. He's looking at times where his life was in danger. He's naming those different places in his time, a time of his life where he was in danger. With people that would, would have did him in, would have did him wrong, would have probably bring destruction to him, but still God preserved him in all of this. Do you know when you put your heart and mind on the work of God that you can be preserved from things that others will probably will vanish away in? Where people will be destroyed in, but you will be a survival, a survivor rather, because you have put Christ first. Did you know that? God was preserving Paul because Paul was putting God first. When you put Christ first and put the things of God first, God will preserve you though you go through hell and high waters. Where you should have been wiped out, you'll be still standing because you put Christ first. Trouble's going to come to everybody's life, but everybody's not going to survive it. Because everybody's not living for Jesus. And those who are not living for Jesus, yes, they're going to get wiped out. In the first round, they're going to be gone. But we're going to make it through every round because we're living for Jesus. Well, round two, ding, 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 back in the ring again, praise God, swinging for Jesus. <laughs> you just came out of a storm to go back into a storm. But it's all good, praise God. It's all good because it's a good fight. Anything that you do for Christ, living for him, suffering for him, is a good fight, praise God. It's a good fight. Hallelujah. And can you take a punch for Jesus? Can you take a punch for him? Paul's taking punches. But can you take a punch for Jesus? Now, how are you going to take a punch when you can't even take a pinch? Every now and then the devil pinch you, you get flare up. <laughs> Praise God, if you can't take a punch, you certainly can't. If you can't take a pinch, rather, you know you can't take a punch. Some of the things you're going through is really minute. I call that a pinch. But it's wrecking you because Christ is not the sinner yet. When he becomes the sinner, you won't even feel that pinch. You're feeling it because you're not where you need to be in him. Praise God. And God's going to let you have some pinches because you're not able to take a punch right now. But once you get your past these little pinches you're going to get, these little things that's nagging you, then we can move on to the bigger things. Praise God. All I do, yeah. Keep reading, daughter. Heathen in the perils and the cities, in the, in the perils in the wilderness, in the perils in the sea, in the perils among false brethren, in the weariness, in the painfulness, in watching often, in hunger, thirst and fasting often and cold and nakedness besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches who is weak and I am not weak who is offended and I am not burn burn not if I must need glory I will glory I will glory all the things which concern my infirmities now watch this so what he's doing and we look at the next chapter he says he learned to glory in his infirmities, instead of complaining about it, this is how you glory in your infirmities. Instead of complaining about what's going wrong, bless God for it. Hallelujah. Thank God that you was able to survive it. Thank God that you was able to go through it. And it didn't, praise God, hurt the relationship and the fellowship with God. Thank God for that. Look at it in a positive way. I went through all of these things, but I'm still serving Jesus. And all of these things I went through, it didn't break me. It made me. It built me. My God, it made me the champion in the spiritual realm that I needed to be. 
Hallelujah. So he learned to glory in his infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon him. Do you know when you glow in your infirmities, you're going to get more anointing from God? Huh? Did you know that? God's going to anoint you heavily. That when people stand in your presence, they will feel the presence of God. Hallelujah. I had a, 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 a manager, praise God, at the job I was applying for. They told me at the end, end of the um, interview, he said, I'm hiring you, not because of what you know. He said, but I'm hiring you because I felt the presence of God while I was talking to you. <laughs> he said, man, I just want to keep on talking to you. He said, listen, is it all right that I come to you and talk to you? I said, man, you can talk to me anytime, praise God. You know we're going to talk about Jesus. You can talk to me, praise God. The man brought me on board. <laughs> because, listen, I, listen, I'm going to tell you how God's presence works. I've been through a whole lot, saints. I've been through things I haven't shared with people. But in it, I learned to glory in my infirmities. Because as I bless God for what I go through, the power of Christ begins to rest more heavily upon me. And that's what Paul learned, praise God. If I glory in my infirmities, not complain, not to become a chronic complainer and everything to go wrong, I start talking wrong, but no, to bless God knowing that God is keeping me in all of this. Then God's power is going to rest heavily upon me. Praise the name of God. I have people walk up to me telling me, I know you're a preacher and begin to share their life with me because God is letting the anointing rest heavily. That souls may be, amen, The souls may be able to access the kingdom of God through your life. That's what it's all about. That's why the devil's trying to fight you. Because he knows that you are influencing others to follow Jesus. Why he's doing everything he can to break up the relationship between you and Christ and see that he can't do it. People are being influenced to follow Jesus. People are looking at your life and making a decision whether they should follow the Lord. And many are following the Lord on the basis of the life you have lived for him. That's what the devil is threatened by. Let's, let's move out into the uh, book, uh, back to the book of Timothy. Let's go to the fourth chapter. Let's get ready to close out. There's a lot more we could talk about in, in, uh, in Corinth, but we're going to try to uh, bring it to a close here. Let's go to the fourth chapter of, uh, I believe, what is it, Second Timothy? Second Timothy, fourth chapter. Yes. Starting at verse 6. Yes. For I am now ready to be offered. Now watch this, because he's done been through... Everything that one could go through, now God has revealed to the man that his ministry has come into a close. The work that God ordained for Apostle Paul to do has been fulfilled. And Paul understands that he has been appointed unto death. Paul understands that. As an apostle, he's a frontline soldier. And he already know how the story is going to end. It's going to end with his death. He's going to be martyred. He knows this. And I believe Paul knew, knew this from the time God called him. The devil was always coming so close to it, but his time wasn't up yet. All the beatings, the whippings was the devil trying to kill him before the time. But he knew he would be martyred. He knew this. Because to be an apostle can oftentimes mean the sentence of death is upon you. I know a lot of pastors like to call themselves apostles. You thank God that you're not. You just grab the title. Because if you was an apostle, some of you wouldn't be willing to die for Jesus. I know that. You just like the title apostle. You know, a pastor's been preaching for years. All of a sudden now they become the apostle. 
no longer bishop so and so, you're the apostle so and so. Well, that sounds good. But you don't know what it means to be an apostle. Most of the people in this modern day that call themselves apostle don't even, they, they don't even know the definition of it. They don't even understand what it means to be an apostle. They just love the title. You know, we got title seekers. Title seekers. This one to be renowned in the eyes of men. But there are some apostles that God has raised up that won't even take the title apostle. But they are an apostle. They are an apostle. Because they do, they're doing the work of an apostle. And they're not even going to tell you that they are an apostle. Because they're trying their best not to take the glory from God. They're not glory seekers. But they seek to glorify God, not themselves, not their flesh. They don't need people praising them and, and, and lording them. But they have a need to glorify God. The true apostles are not even going to tell you that they are in this modern day time. The true apostles, they're not even going to tell you that they are. They're just going to do the work of an apostle. And their works will speak for them. But a whole lot of folk that never was called to be an apostle today is calling themselves apostles. And they're not. They're not. If I was a name caller, I could go down a long list of people that call themselves apostles. <laughs> Just not apostles. But I don't want to deter you from the word today. That's why I try not to be, you know, to, I don't, I don't want to call names. I don't try to be a name caller because then you're going to get caught up in that and that into the message. I'm so careful not to do that. God would deal with them. I don't have to call them out. God's going to take care of every one of them. It's not my job to do that. But it is my job to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God. So I try to keep people focused. We're going to stay with the message so you don't end up going astray in name calling. But let's look what this brother got to say. I'm ready to be offered because guess what? He know that the sentence of death is upon him. He know that. He knew this when God first called him. That's why Paul told the people when God first called him, and they, and, and Paul, they told Paul not to go down to Jerusalem because the people was going to kill him down there. Paul told them this was in the beginning of his walk. He said, I'm not willing only to live for the Lord, but I'm willing to both die for the name of Jesus. That's how he came in. Paul started on that note, willing to die for Jesus. Then he told the Philippians, he said, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. He was already always prepared to die for Jesus. He knew what it meant to be an apostle. The sense of death is upon you because you're a frontline soldier. The devil is going to try his best to kill the influence that one has on those coming to Christ. And those as high in the high up ministries that God has ordained them to be in as an apostle, they have the greatest influence when it comes to leading people to Christ than any other level of ministry has. But as, as in every military, when a war goes forth, we give greater honor to those that die out in the battlefield than those that come back home from the battlefield. And those that die for Jesus have greater honor than we that have not. Praise God. They have greater honor. And God has greater rewards prepared for them. As every military would do. They praise the soldiers that died on the battlefield more than the ones that returned back home. So it's an honor to die for this cause because it's a great cause. It's worth dying for. Praise God. The cause of Christ. So let's read Brother Paul. We can bring it to a close. He said, I'm ready now to glorify God in death, I'm ready to be offered. Go ahead. Read that verse again. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought, I have fought a good fight. Now watch this. He, he's coming to the close. He's, no, no, he told Timothy, and he's still, he's still writing to Timothy, 
But at this point, he's coming to the close of his ministry. And he's telling Timothy, he told Timothy initially to fight a good fight. And now that he knows that he's going to be offered, he says, listen, my departure's at hand. I have fought a good fight. My God, my God. I went through a whole lot for the Lord. I'm feeling good about leaving now because I never deserted in this army. I never was a deserter. I was never a traitor. But I fought for my Lord. My God, my God. You can look at my back and see all the marks and whips that's on me. Because of what I went through for the love that I had for my king. My God. God, my God. When they try to break me, they couldn't break me. When they try to turn me from serving Christ, they couldn't do it. I fought a good fight. My God, I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. What happens after that? I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Listen, I finished my course. See, already, I did everything God told me to do. It's the, listen, I'm going to tell you, saints of God. It's not about, I know people go to the Psalms and talk about three score and ten. If by reason of strength, four score. It's not about that. It's about finishing your course in this New Testament. I know in the Old Testament, they, God told them they could live up to 70 years. And told some by reason of strength, they could live up to 80 years. But my God, your time is not even measured that way. It's measured by how much you do for the Lord and how much... Praise God, time God has given you to use for to do for the Lord. And Paul said, the time God gave me, my God, I did everything he told me. I finished it. I finished it. I finished my course. My God, my, I didn't have a life of vanity. My life was never about me. Once I got saved, my life was about Jesus. From day one up until this time that I'm about to leave, it was all about Jesus. I finished my course. My God, my God. The devil never swayed me to the left or to the right, but I stayed in the straight path, the narrow path. My God, my God. He couldn't trick me. He couldn't deceive me. He couldn't lure me into places that God had never ordained for me to be in. But I stayed in the will of God. I, I finished my course. My God, my God, I finished my course. I left on foul what it means to be truly dedicated and committed to this cause. I left it on foul. I finished my course. If you look at my life, look at my record, my God. Look at how I live for the Lord. Look at what I went through for him. Things that would have caused others to break, to crumble, under impact, I remain standing. I finished my course. Yes. Keep reading, daughter. I have kept the faith. See. I finished my course. I kept the faith. I did everything God ordained for me to do. It has been done. I kept the faith. Yes. Keep reading. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and that not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So I'm leaving, praise God, record, leaving on file that now I've done everything God has told me. I can step into the next dimension. The curtain has been pulled back. I see a crown that's waiting for me. I'm, I'm, see, it's just what happens when you're ready to leave. The curtain gets pulled back. And you can step right, you can see right into the spiritual realm. Because you're ready to forget about this life. And all you can see is your eternity. The curtains have been pulled back. I see a crown. See, you, can, you, you begin to see things. Because God allows those, amen, that's ready to enter into, praise God there, ready to step out of time and ready to step into eternity. They can see what awaits them. He said, I see a crown, my God. 
I see a crown. God's about to reward me for everything I've done for him down here on earth. I see a crown, praise God. Amen. I see a crown. I don't even see the chopping block. That's what I'm about to face. He's about to go to Nero's chopping block. I don't even see that. I see a crown. I don't, I'm not threatened by that. I'm not threatened by Caesar and what he can do. I'm not even concerned about that. But I can see into another dimension. And I can see absent from the body I'm present with the Lord. I can see, my God. I can see that I'm ready to step into eternity. I'm not worried about the chopping block. According to history, he went to Nero's chopping block. He was beheaded, Brother Paul. And according to history, history tells that Paul ran out of way. He ran to the chopping block. Here I am. I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. Praise God. Go ahead and take my life because once you take my life, I'm going to be with the Lord. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'm not afraid of death because I know what happens after death for the believer. So he said, I'm ready to be offered. My departure is at hand. My God, my God. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Now there's a crown awaiting me. And not for me only. But for those that love is appearing. Because see, I'm, I'm ready to end this fight. To step into eternal life. But there's something that I have to keep on fighting. It's for you. This crown that I'm about to receive is for those that are still in the fight. There's a crown for everyone that loves is appearing. My God, my God. For everyone that loves Jesus more than they love this life. There's a crown waiting for you. Paul said, but I fought a good fight. We're going to end it right there. I fought a good fight. The devil couldn't break me. He couldn't stop me. And he couldn't block me. Everywhere, everything he came with, I was able to just move around it and step over it. Nothing stopped me from pleasing my Lord. And for giving him the glory and praise in my life. Nothing stopped that. Give your life this day to the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and unto your children. And unto those are far off, and as, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.